So good afternoon. Welcome to the Agilent Vendor Seminar at the HPRC 2013 conference here in Amsterdam. Before I start, my name is Michael Frank. I'm the marketing director for the um, HPLC business and the solution and capillary electrophoresis business at Agilent. We decided this year to focus this vendor seminar around a typical task in the analytical lab, hunting the mist compound. On other words, we would like to show you a lot of Agilent tools, how you can improve the quality of your separations, how you can be sure that you do not have missed any compounds in your analysis, and to improve your, the confidence in your separations. To illustrate this, have a look to this chronogram. I think it looks quite nice. It's an impurity analysis, as everybody is quite familiar from the pharmaceutical industry with. Looks quite nice. All compounds nicely separated. However, can you be sure that you do not have missed the compound here in the injection peak, compound without retention? Or if you look to this peak here, are you 100% sure that you do not have a coallusion with a second peak here? Typical problem, if you have the main impurity here, the main compound, are you sure that nothing is underneath this compound? Or if you look here, is it just baseline? Or maybe you have chosen the wrong detector? And finally, is really everything being eluted from your column in the meantime? Well, I think these are typical problems you will encounter every day in the analytical lab if you're developing methods. And we would like to show you some tools how you can improve this. And this is also how our booth is set up here at the conference. We have four major topics on our booth, and we're also having this here in, in the talk, focusing on selectivity, how you can improve the selectivity of a separation by changing automatically stationary and mobile faces. Then going a level higher, talking about orthogonal separations to the standard reversed phase LC analysis most of the people are doing. Here we would like to focus on two-dimensional LC, SFC, and also capillary electrophoresis. Then in the second part, my colleague Udo Huber will talk about efficiency, how important efficiency will be for your separations, and show you also some interesting stuff here. And finally, he will help you to decide on the perfect detector for your separations. Okay, coming to the first part, selectivity and changing stationary phases and mobile phases. We choose an example first here, metroprolol and related impurities. If you're working in the pharma industry, simply replace metroprolol by your next blockbuster compound, bring your company billions of dollars of revenues. So typical task here, identifying the impurities of compounds, of pharmaceutical compounds, for example, um, in analytical runs. We want to make a screening here first, so we choose short columns and rather short gradients, five-minute gradients here. And to be sure that we really cover a lot of different separation conditions to increase the selectivity of the separation, we took in this example five different columns, five mobile phases or aqueous mobile phases with different pH values. For simplicity, we simply used here acetonitrile. And we would take all these combinations then we also did two injections per sample, so this will end up in 42 sample runs altogether. Then between changing mobile phases, you need to flush the system. You might also want to, to equilibrate the columns sufficiently, so this will also add additional methods to, to the sequence. So overall, this approach here ends up with 73 sequence lines, and now to simply imagine if you would have to type in or generate 42 um, method files or, and then 73 sequence lines manually. I think everybody who's working in the lab knows how long this will take. I would say an experienced user can do this maybe in two hours, but will this be error-free? I don't know. This is the one part of the, the equation here, doing all these manual method settings, entering timetables, selecting the right bulb position, and so on. The other one is the pure analysis time. I said we have simply five minute gradients here. However, all the run times will end up at almost 14 hours of the system. Well, if you have to change the columns manually, change solvents manually, I think everybody imagine how long this will take for you. Okay, but first look to the results here, how important it is to change the different conditions. So on this screen here, we simply looking on one 
uh, mobile phase condition and having different column stationary phases screened here. And you can easily see how big the differences are already between these different columns here. And I would like to focus a little bit on the first two peaks here. So these are the interesting peaks of this separation that need to be separated. Obviously, the extend C18 column is the best one. But again, if you look to the first two peaks here, and now here, they're changing retention order or illusion order. Maybe slightly different conditions, different temperature, and they would, again, perfectly coelute in bet between. The result of changing the, the separation conditions are much more obvious if you're looking to the mobile phases and different pH values. So here we are having just one stationary phase and changing the pH value of the solvent. And you can see at pH 6.4, more or less all of these compounds are gone, probably hidden underneath the main peak here. I do not want to go through all these 42 iterations of different separation conditions, and I think this is also very important that you do not have to do this fully manually because it's also time-consuming. To help you with this, we have the Agilent Intelligent Reporter tool and templates that come with a our system here that helps you to get a quick overview about the data and can look like this. So this is one representation of the data where you have the different retention or um, separation conditions, the different columns and different solvents, and the bubble size simply gives you the maximum number of peaks you have got in this separation. So I think it's quite obvious that this, this, this condition is quite promising. Many peaks found here probably these conditions you would not follow up later on with any fine-tuning. So also here you have a nice tool to help you to get a quick overview about your separation results. Of course, you can also get all the chronographic data. You can get it um, in, in tables, starting with a separation with the highest number of found peaks and going down. Then you can simply check which separation condition is the most promising one for doing some fine-tuning. And here's actually the system that can do all of this for you. It's a 1290 Infinity Method Development System. The key parts here are two additional solvent selection valves that will allow you to have up to 24 additional solvents on your system for different organic phases, different pH buffers with different pH values, different modifiers. And also key part of the system is the column compartment cluster with built-in eight-position selection valves that allow you to have up to eight different columns in the system. If you multiply the combinations, this will give you more than 1,000 unique separation conditions. So very important besides the hardware and giving you all this flexibility to, to have up to 1,000 different conditions without manually exchanging columns, wearing out fittings and so on, manually changing solvents, Software is a very important part of the equation here. So for simple method screening, we have the Agilent Method Scouting Wizard software. This is an add-on to the OpenLab CDS Camp Station software. It's a very simple tool. It's a um, wizard-type software. Here you can define what you would like to do in your screening campaign. For example, only screening columns, only screening solvents, screening columns and solvents, and furthermore, you can also add different temperatures into the screening equation, or you can also have then preset or predefined gradients you would like to screen, giving you essentially a four-dimensional matrix that can be set up with the system. As I said, it's a very simple tool. It's a wizard-type um, software. You simply go through it, select what you would like to do here, select the columns you would like to use, select the solvents you would like to use, can set up some gradients, and at the end, you get a big screening table. The software already checks if the columns, for example, are incompatible with the pH values or with the temperatures you, you decided to use here, and will automatically exclude these combinations to be sure that your columns won't be damaged. At the end, you can enter a couple of samples, for example, standard samples, degradation study samples, um, the pure compounds, if you like. And this software will automatically generate all the required methods and the complete sequence line or se sequence table without any errors and mistakes in setting up the, the methods. So when I said at the beginning, setting up all this manual for the shown examples will take at least two hours. Here with this software, you can set it up in less than 
let's say, two minutes. Then the system will full, uh, run fully automatically, for example, overnight, checking all the screening conditions. Then the, the next morning you get to come into the lab, check the results, then start maybe fine-tuning on the most promising combination of solvent and um, column. However, if you would like to go a step further, we can highly recommend you to use one of our partner solutions for automated method optimization for robustness tests to turn your LC system into a really complete automated QBD method development system. We are partnering with ACD Labs, with Chrome SWORD, and also with um, S Matrix. They're using our, or fully supporting our hardware and um, using OpenLab CDS Chem Station running in the background to control this. And I think with the method scouting result from Agilent and these three um, software package, we have the, the biggest portfolio of software to support you in your method development tasks. Now I would like to switch gears, come to the next level, as I already mentioned at the beginning, and speak about orthogonal separation means to reverse phase LC. First of all, I would like to talk about two-dimensional two LC. You have seen during this conference here, there have been already many, many presentations on 2D LC. Actually, a couple of them, or many of them, have been um, presented results um, acquired on our 2D LC system. I also do not want to go into too much detail explaining the 2D LC system, as a couple of, of other speakers have shown this already. Principle 2D LC system is very simple. You have your standard LC system with a pump auto sampler column, and now you're replacing the detector of a standard system with a second LC system. Just the auto sampler is replaced by a valve, and this valve adds simply as an injection valve to the second dimension column, and finally you have the detector acquiring the data. There are two principal different methods for 2DLC. First one is comprehensive 2DLC. Second one is hard-cutting 2DLC. Comprehensive 2DLC takes the complete effluent of the first dimension column. So here, first dimension column, the valve in between, also called modulation valve, and then your second column. So everything that comes out of the first dimension column will be injected to the second dimension column. If you think, think through it, it's obvious that you need to have two loops at this valve, one loops being filled during the time the second loop is being analyzed on the second dimension column. So by doing this, if you have a chromatogram coming out of or coming out of the first dimension column, you're chopping it into very small slices, injecting it to the second dimension column, and here you run pretty fast gradients, typically below one minute runtime, and do reanalysis of everything that has been eluded from the first dimension column. So you get a many, many chromatograms in the second dimension. Then you use a software to restack this and have a nicer visualization. And typically, this will be shown in a two-dimensional contour plot. And if you have a sufficiently orthogonal separation conditions on the second dimension to the first dimension, then your chances simply rises to get any co-eluting peaks from the first dimension finally separated on the second dimension. This is really the power of the comprehensive 2D LC, dramatically increasing the resolution of your system and the chance to find so far unresolved peaks. This, here's a real-life example. This was actually presented yesterday. We received this from Gerd von Honacker from the RIC. And he worked on triptych digest of monoclonal antibodies. You can easily see here, if you look to, to these compounds, I've roughly counted them. There are around 100 compounds separated here. You can hardly see it, but the runtime here is around 30 minutes. So if you think in peak capacity terms, we are talking about hundreds of, of um, peak capacities in less than 30, or in roughly 30 minutes. So in this example, he used reverse phase times reverse phase and using to sufficiently orthogonal columns, the bonus RP column and the Eclipse plus C18 column, to get already this great separation here. Yesterday also showed totally orthogonal separation means with the same type of sample in the same system using strong cation exchange um, separation versus reversed phase. 
There's another thing I would like to, to show you, and again, hardly to see, but this is the runtime on the second dimension here. The number up here is 22 seconds. So the second dimension in this example is running with 22 second gradients. And yesterday, Gerhard von Honecker also showed the retention time reproducibility data. For this example, we were talking about 0.05 and 0.09% RSDs on the retention times in the second dimension. I think this is quite remarkable. Coming to the second type of doing 2DLC, this is hard cutting 2DLC. With hard cutting 2DLC, you do not take the complete affluent of the first dimension, but you select only a peak of interest. Again, you will then take this peak you're interested in, sample it, and inject it to a second column. Since you do not now have the time constraints of comprehensive 2DLC, with the need to have very fast gradients, you can now use a longer column in the second dimension and have also longer run times in the second dimension. So only parts are being used for the second dimension. Gradients can be longer. So you have more information in the second dimension for the specific analysis, but you will, of course, lose all information of the unsampled peaks here. And also here we have a nice example to show you the power of doing hard cutting to DLC. There have also been talks at the conference showing this with um, other real life examples from, from pharmaceutical industry. So here's one example, again a pharmaceutical impurity um, compound main compound here, and then six identified impurities. And the conditions have already been with sub to micron particle columns on a rather long column with actually already high resolution. However, if we do now 2D, hard cutting 2 DLC with this system or sample and cut out the main peak here and then analyze the main peak on a column with a different selectivity using now a phenyl hexyl column instead of a C80, well, surprise, surprise, there was something underneath this big peak now nicely being separated and identified as another impurity in the sample. So <clears throat> this illustrates how important or how helpful, beneficial 2DLC can be to not miss any compound here in your samples. The system that allows you to do both comprehensive 2DLC and hard cutting 2DLC is the 1290 2DLC solution. It's based mainly on a 1290 Infinity system with a second pump for the second dimension, column compartment with a special valve to do the injections into the second dimension, and then, very important, a very easy to use additional 2DLC acquisition software that makes it really a task of, of few minutes to set up 2DLC methods and also very complex gradient patterns for the second dimension. I think this was also shown in the presentation from Gerd von Honecker yesterday. He used so-called shifted gradients, gradients that from one injection to the, second in, to the next injection, changing the percent B of the gradient. Again, taking a lot of time away from the user to set up this manually with this software, again, making it the task of a few minutes. And very important for the data analysis, especially of the comprehensive 2DLC data, we are also have a powerful software available, and this comes again from one of our partner companies, which is GC Image Incorporated from the US, and I have to apologize, there's a little typo in here, the software calls LCLC Image Software. So this is a very powerful software to do data analysis of comprehensive to DLC samples, doing automated peak identification, quantitation. Um, it allows you to compare samples of different origin shows you the differences between the different samples, also the differences in, in quantities of compounds in different samples. So a really powerful tool to get um, information rich data out of your comprehensive 2DLC run. Okay, so much for 2DLC. Now I would like to go to another orthogonal separation means compared or orthogonal to um, reverse space LC. This is supercritical fluid chromatography. To illustrate the power of SFC in points of orthogonality, we have this example here. So here, analysis of a um, PAH mix with UHPLC, reversed phase, and now look how this looks with SFC, so total different elution order. Again, this will help you if you have any co-eluting peaks, for example, in, in the um, reverse phase mode, to get them separated with a different means here. 
And also, we're looking to the sensitivity of our SFC system. It's fully sufficient to support also impurity analysis and impurity profiling down to an 0.01% level. We'll still have sufficient uh, signal to noise to achieve such low limits here. And it, what is really nice about the SFC system, it can be directly combined with UHPLC. So with our SFC hybrid UHPLC system, you are able in one system to switch between SFC and reverse phase LC in one system from one sequence line to the next sequence line. This is really a powerful tool. And I would also like to, to mention here the SFC system from Agilent can be operated up to 600 bars. It's a full UHPLC system giving you the full flow range, range also on the LC um, uh, SFC part, if you're using, for example, modifiers with a higher viscosity, this can be done with this system very easily. Last orthogonal separation method I would like to present here is capillary electrophoresis. Also at this conference, we have seen a couple of presentations around CE, and I think CE is a really powerful tool to complement um, LC separations. It's use, very useful for charged substances like biomolecules, but also small small basic acidic compounds and ions. It has really high separation power, typically way above 40,000 plates. It's fast, it only needs minute sample amounts. There's almost no sample preparation required, fully orthogonal to HPLC. And what's also nice, since it uses only very few milliliters of, of buffers and very little amount of, of samples, you can really regard this as a um, green method. To illustrate the power of capillary electrophoresis, I've chosen here one example. So there was in 2008 an incident, unfortunately with some fatal um, incidents here, with an impurity in heparin. So this can be found on the FDA homepage. And the problem at the end could be drilled down to an impurity in the heparin. However, the investigators tried really many, many different separation means. And at the end, only CE could get this unknown compound, which was toxic, separated from the heparin. And you can see here, where is it said? Uh, oh, don't see it. That they really run to a bunch of different separation methods before they finally ended up with a CE, and CE was then so easily to be used and easily got a result here in less than 10 minutes. Clearly nice separated peak here to get this problem solved here because it's fully orthogonal to the HPLC methodologies. What is very nice about the Agilent 7100 CE system, it can also be combined with our high-end mass spectrometers, for example, the QTOF systems. The whole system is completely supported or can be run under the Mass Hunter software. So you have one software running the CE part, running the high-end MS part, and generating fantastic data, for example, biomolecules. Okay, with this, I'm at the end of my part, and I would like now to hand over to Udo Huber to talk about efficiency in separations and then also on detection methods. Okay, thank you, Michael. Um, I have to talk now a little bit about efficiency. And honestly, if you compare it to the tools uh, Michael has presented already, it's certainly the weakest tool you have. It's certainly weaker than selectivity and orthogonality. They are more powerful. Well, Michael is my boss, so he was allowed to talk about those. Um, efficiency, or if you, if you point it down to, to number of uh, theoretical plates, is the weakest tool because if you remember the equation for the resolution, unfortunately the number of plates is underneath the square root, which means if you double the number of plates, you only get the square root of two more on resolution. Yeah? So therefore it's really weak compared to selectivity, for example. Um, well, what you usually do to uh, increase the number of theoretical plates, you reduce the uh, particle size, and when you do so, your pressure increases. And unfortunately, the pressure increases with the square of the particle size. Yeah? So you, for example, multiply your pressure by 4 while you get the square root of 2 more on resolution. And therefore, as I said, it's much weaker than, for example, um, selectivity. Now, what I always emphasize is that the higher pressure you, you need when you run a UHPLC system is really not a feature. The pressure does not separate anything. It's a side effect, and as most side effects, it's a negative side effect. Because, of course, there are things like frictional heating when you go to higher pressures. There are things like uh, uh, unpredictable selectivity changes when you go to higher pressure. I think there is also a talk about that 
in the scientific uh, part of the, of the conference. Um, another big disadvantage is the new HPLC systems are more expensive than the HPLC systems, and that is simply because you need different material to withstand the higher pressure. There is more engineering going into these systems to make sure they, they work properly. Well, so the heart of the system to get more efficiency, to get more number of plates, is actually the particles you are using, the UHPLC particles. And obviously, you can go down to smaller particles, as shown here, from 5 micron traditional particles to sub-2 micron particles. Uh, of course, on the other hand, you can also use the superficially porous particles to get more efficiency, to get more uh, plate numbers. And we have an example here. As I said, it's not the strongest tool. However, it's probably a tool which is easily accessible because most of our customers have UHPLC systems in their lab nowadays, so it's easily accessible. And here is an example which we got from a customer. A, it was a pharmaceutical customer and in an isocratic impurity method. And this customer always had some issues with the impurities which elude here at the, at the front of the chromatogram. Um, because he saw four peaks there, and two of them were not really baseline separated, and so he wasn't really happy with the, with the integration of those two. And he asked us if we couldn't do anything, and we said, yeah, well, when you use the same column, but you reduce your particle size maybe to 3.5 micron, or even to sub-2 micron particles, you get more number of plates, you get more resolution, and maybe we can separate the two impurities uh, to baseline separation. Well, honestly, it worked perfect. It worked even too good because what turned out, in the end, he did not see four impurities but seven impurities, and three of them he had not seen before, and he had no idea what they are. Now, the point here is um, there he missed some compounds, or over here he missed some compounds which were revealed over here. So I hope this shows that even the, the number of theoretical plates is a valuable tool to assure that you do not miss any compounds. Well, when I listen to the, to the presentations, to also to the scientific presentations, many of them talk about isocratic analysis where you use the number of theoretical plates. However, if you ask me, probably most analyses nowadays are done by gradient uh, analysis. And when you look at gradient analysis, people look at the peak capacity. And the peak capacity, simply speaking, is just the number of peaks you can fit into your chromatogram with a sufficient, let's say, baseline resolution. So if you look at this, what the, this chromatogram you, you see here, we have, if you, if you would count them, 32 peaks in about 2.5 minutes. Now, honestly, I have never seen a real-life chromatogram looking like that. Actually, it's Photoshopped, of course. So what does the peak capacity mean for you if you ask the questions, do I miss any compound? And, well, if you look in the literature, you find things like the statistical theory of peak overlap. And when you read a little bit further, you find, for example, those two sentences here. And the first one is saying that peak resolution is severely compromised when the number of components present in the sample overrates one-third of the peak capacity. If you think about the chromatogram on the last page, we had a peak capacity of 32. So you can say if you have 10 compounds in your sample and you use this analysis method, you should be all right. So if you have 11 or 12 or maybe 15 compounds in there, there is a high chance that there are two compounds which co -elute. On the other hand, if you read the second sentence, in order to resolve 98% of the components, the peak capacity must exceed the number of components by a factor of 100. What does that mean? If you have samples to analyze, and let's say all of those samples contain just two compounds. Yeah? So if you have just two compounds, you need a peak capacity of 200. And when you have such a method, and you inject 100 samples with two peaks, in 98% cases, in 98 of these samples, you will really separate those two peaks. But there are still two examples where you probably do not separate those two peaks. Yeah? So again, a high peak capacity helps you to assure that you do not miss any peak, that you do not miss any compound. Well, and I did some simple illustration here. I don't want to talk too much about peak capacity and don't go into too many details. There are many scientific presentations about this topic. Um, but what I have done here is I have just calculated for a certain method uh, column. You see I have used already sub-2 micron particles because what is also true, as narrower the peaks are in your chromatogram, 
as more peaks you can fit into it. So the goal is to have get really narrow peaks, and how do you do that? Well, one thing is to use UHPLC columns, superficially porous, or in this case, we use sub to micron. And the other thing you can do is increase your flow rate, because when you increase your flow rate, the peaks get narrower, and you can fit more peaks into your chromatogram. So what I have done here is, and I said this is only for illustration purposes, I have calculated the peak capacity for three different column lengths, so the blue curve is the 50 millimeter, the red one the 100, and the green one the 150 millimeter column. And what I have also done, I have calculated the back pressure, because of course when you use higher flow rates you get more back pressure, and the dashed lines here are the back pressure you generate with the 50, 100, and 150 millimeter column. If you have a 400 bar system, then if you look here, this is where the maximum flow rate you can achieve and that equals a peak capacity of that value. And if you do the same for the 100 millimeter column and the 150 millimeter column, those are the peak capacities you can achieve. Now, if you use, instead of the 400 bar system that is shown here, a 1200 bar system, for example, then that is the maximum back pressure you can achieve. And you can immediately see you could even achieve more peak capacity than the 50 millimeter column is able to deliver and you can achieve a lot higher peak capacity when you use the 100 and the 150 millimeter column. Of course, you could now say, well, then I use a system with the higher back pressure. Of course, you could. Unfortunately, as far as I know, there are no UHPLC columns uh, commercially available that go to higher back pressure than 1,200 bars. So if you want to go to the highest peak capacity to make sure you don't miss any compound, the UHPLC system is certainly a valuable tool. If you want to come to our booth and have a look, we have two of them uh, there, the 1290 Infinity Binary LC system and the Quaternary system. And maybe one word about the Quaternary system. Uh, it's a low-pressure mixing system, and they are on the market also for a, for a very long time. However, I would say we more or less reinvented the Quaternary system because so far you would have never used a Quaternary system at the edges of the gradient, meaning when you run a gradient from, let's say, 1 to 10 percent. That was usually where you go to a high-pressure mixing system because you get, got uh, irreproducible results due to the solvent delivery. What we have done with our 1290 quaternary system, we have run a step gradient from 0 to 10 percent B in 1 percent steps. And when you overlay the program gradient and what you really achieve in a step gradient, you hardly spot any difference. When we do an application running with from 2 to 12 percent, we have done that with caffeine and theophylline. They are rather polar. We get really excellent uh, retention time, um, uh, uh, re relative standard deviations for the retention time. So really, we say it's a quaternary pump with binary pump performance. Well, so far we talked about separating compounds. Make sure we separate every compound from the other compound which, of course, is fine. On the other hand, if you separate your compound and you can't detect them, you, it, it's really no, no help for you. So when we look at detection, I call the first slide the myth of the universal detector because in LC there is no universal detector, full stop. So we have different detectors. For example, um, the most common one is the UV detector, and to detect compounds, you need a chromophore in this compound. And unfortunately, usually the impurities, they don't have one, and so you, you, you don't see them. Also, there are uh, evaporative light scattering detectors around, and there you need a compound which is less volatile than the mobile phase. Well, that's usually not too much of a problem. However, there are also some other things with the, all the evaporative detectors. For example, the response depends on the mobile phase um, composition. You have a nonlinear calibration curve. Well, that's not too much an if, of an issue. The data system usually can do nonlinear calibration curves. But again, there are still compounds you cannot see in the evaporative light scattering detector. Also, the MS, the mass spectrometry, is not a universal detector. It's a universal ion detector because you have to ionize your compound to make sure you really see it in your MS. Um, well, probably the greatest disadvantage of the MS is that it's more expensive compared to the other detectors. So everybody wants to have one, but sometimes it's too expensive. The refractive index detector honestly comes really close to a universal detector. It has universal response, and you can probably detect most compounds or all compounds. However, then you are limited to isocratic runs. And the RID is really only a, a, a detector for the patient operator because it takes some time until you have really equilibrated it and you get a stable baseline. 
Well, the fluorescence detector is certainly not a universal detector, and that's its strength, because not many compounds show fluorescent, and so it's highly selective. So you can analyze compound even in a matrix if they are fluorescent, because there is a high chance that all the other compounds or most other compounds in your sample, in your matrix, uh, are not detected. So this is a big advantage. It's very sensitive. However, when you look from a perspective of a of a universal detector, it's really not ideal because, as I said, not too many compounds are fluorescent. Then there are some other detectors around, like the electrochemical detector or the chemiluminescence nitrogen detector. Well, they are also noted uh, 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 in universal detectors because, for example, for the CL and the, the compound must contain nitrogen. Okay, they do that very often. However, when you use a CL and D, using acetonitrile as a mobile phase is not really a good idea, of course. Now, what do you do if you not have the universal tool? Well, you need to have tools that match as good as possible. And therefore, we have, for example, many detectors in our portfolio. So we have non-MS detectors at the top. I'll talk about them in a minute. But we have, of course, also DMS detectors at the bottom. And when you talk about DMS detectors, it's very important that on the right-hand side, you have the mass analyzer. And it's more or less independent of the mass analyzer whether you can detect a compound or not. As long as you stay in the mass range, I think you can probably detect any compound with any detector, as long as you have ionized a compound. And for that, the ion source is responsible, and that is shown here on the, on the left-hand side. If we have a closer look, the bro the, probably the most used source is the electrospray ionization source. And... Uh, we have that in a different flavor. It's the jet stream technology you see here on the right-hand side. So that one, where an additional nitrogen stream, heated nitrogen stream, um, enhances the sensitivity by assuring that more ions get into the MS analyzer. However, not all compounds can be ionized by electrospray. So there are other sources, for example, the APCI sources, or then things like the atmospheric pressure photoionization, but I think this source, it's similar to the story to the FLD. So this selectively ionizes certain compounds, so it's more a source where you uh, uh, analyze specific compounds out of a matrix. What is very nice is the multimode source we have in our portfolio, because with this multimode source, you can do electrospray and APCI simultaneously. Um, I have stolen this picture from our MS colleagues. So when you look at all the compounds you want to analyze regarding polarity and molecular weight, you can see there is a typical field for electrospray ionization and a typical field of atmospheric pressure chemical ionization. And now with the combined source, you also combine those two, those two areas, so to say. Here is an example that is done with the uh, multimode source. I admit it's a wild mix of compounds to show that, but you have here the hexanosulfonic acid, which responds only in negative electrospray. The next peak is the endo, which responds only in positive APCI. The other compound um, responds only in negative APCI, and the last one in positive electrospray. So we combined the different ionization mechanisms, APCI and electrospray, in addition to negative and, and positive uh, analysis mode. Yeah? So it's really a compound that makes sure that all the compounds are ionized, and then you can detect them with your mass analyzer, whichever is attached to the back of the source. Well, we can also talk a little bit about the non-MS detectors, and there you see the, the usual ones on the, on the left-hand side, the UV detectors, uh, variable wavelengths, multi-wavelengths, and diode ray detector. The fluorescence detector, the RI detector, the ELSD, and on the right-hand side, you see what we call the multi-detector suite. That's a combined detector containing a light-scattering detector, so not an evaporative light-scattering detector, but a light-scattering detector, a refractive index detector, and a viscosity detector. And this one is usually used for GPC or SEC, so analysis of uh, polymers or analysis of large bio biomolecules, so for example, proteins. I want to point out one thing, and that's our new evaporative light scattering detector, uh, which you see on this slide. And it got a blue laser light source. Uh, and with this one, instead of the light-emitting diode of the, of the other model, it allows a lower detection limit. And there are two nice things. One is the sub-ambient evaporation temperature. 
that allows you to detect semi-volatile compounds. And what I like most is the gas flow pro programming. Um, because this gas flow programming helps you to get rid of, for example, DMSO, which might be your sample solvent. So DMSO is very often used as a sample solvent. And when you inject such a sample, you get this huge DMSO peak here at the beginning of the chromatogram, not even, in, uh, not, not even only in UV detection when you run at low wavelengths, but also here in the, in the ELSD. Now, what you traditionally would do is you would increase the temperature of the, of the ELSD, and that works. That removes your DMSO, but unfortunately, it very often removes also the other compounds from your chromatogram because they also evaporate. So what we have done here is we have not changed the temperature, but we have changed the gas flow from 1.6 to 3.0 liters, and you can see the DMSO peak here is gone, and you lose also a little bit of sensitivity for the other compound, but... I think if you really do that with the temperature, you remove the DMSO completely, you would probably not see the other peaks anymore. So that's really a nice feature that you can do the gas uh, flow programming. Now, what you can also do when you do not have a universal detector, you can, of course, combine detectors. And this is also a little bit of a schematic. I go to the next slide and show you what it means. Um, when you look at the detectors, of course, with the NMR, you can probably detect all the organic compounds. We haven't talked about any others so far. However, NMR, well, you can combine it with, with LC, but it's certainly not a routine detector for your routine lab. So that's the reason why I painted it red. Um, the RI detector, as mentioned, would certainly be a kind of a universal detector. However, if you would use this in a system, you could not run a gradient. Yeah? So it also does not really qualify uh, uh, to make a detector combination. If you look on the other side, it's the CLND, which also has a high probability to detect a compound. However, then that limits your analysis of using no acetonitrile because it's nitrogen in acetonitrile, you can't use it, and the other two are probably too selective. However, if you look at the three in the middle, you have the evaporative light scattering detector, UV and MS, you can combine them very easily, and this gives you a system where you really have a high probability to detect all the compounds in your sample. If you do this, the setup is really not too difficult. You take the flow coming out of the UV detector, you have a splitter, you can use a simple T piece here and split a little bit of the flow into the MS. You see a single quadrupole here in this case, and the rest goes then to the fluorescence detector. And this is an example chromatogram here at the top where you see nicely here the two peaks in the UV vis. You see there is already a third one here at the end and a one here at the front in the ELSD, and you can at least detect those last three with the MS. So again, this combination gives you a high probability to detect all the compounds in your sample. Now, I just said we were talking only about organic compounds so far. However, your sample can, of course, contain also compounds which are non-organic, non which you maybe not see with the UV detector. A uh, prominent example are heavy metals, and there is a new regulation out for the pharmaceutical industry to detect heavy metals in pharmaceutical uh, uh, drugs and formulations. And we have other detectors that help you with that. For example, when we talk about the non-organic compounds, we have systems like the ICP OES and the ICP MS to help you detect uh, heavy metals, for example. There is other stuff like the UV VIS and the FTIR you see down here, which are detectors when you do not need a separation. And then really for the high-end detection, you have the NMR systems or the X-ray crystallography systems also from Edge and Technologies. And uh, with that, I think we have another few minutes for questions, if you like. Thank you very much. Thanks for the nice presentation. I have one question concerning this multi-mode arm. Sirs, do you have to define some sort of a retention window, or is this done simultaneously? No, it's done simultaneously. Okay. That's the big difference. It's not switching between yeah. electrospray and APCI. There are dedicated zones in the source, a dedicated zone where, where electrospray ionization is done and a dedicated source where APCI is done. So it's really simultaneously. It's not switching. Yeah, so it's doing it at the same time. You can also use it in dedicated electrospray mode, if you like, or dedicated APCI, but when you do both, it's really simultaneously doing that. If you use it in a dedicated mode, would this uh, mean that you have some loss in sensitivity yep. in comparison to the yep. R? 
Yeah. Standalone. Yeah. So if you compare, if you run the multi-mode source in electrospray mode and compare the savage sensitivity to the dedicated electrospray source, it will be a little bit lower in sensitivity. Yeah. I can't give you a number from the top of my head, but it will be a little bit lower, of course, because the electrospray source geometry is designed really to optimize electrospray, and so the, the, the multi-mode source is in this kind a little bit of a compromise. Yeah. Thank you.